uh, David, I was really intrigued by your newsletter, uh, and you named Judge Pauline Newman, who fact check, I believe, uh, is 96 years old, not the 3000 I indicated <laughs> earlier, uh, 96 years old, involved in a fight over her future, um, in her circuit. And she's on the federal circuit and her colleagues are essentially trying to force her retirement, which is a really interesting issue that I don't think we're paying enough attention to because everyone sort of looks at it and says, you're 96. Of course, right? Um, <laughs> but there are broader issues here. So you, you named Judge Pauline Newman Judge of the Week, uh, in original jurisdiction, which if you're not subscribed to, subscribe to it. Walk us through. Why is she Judge of the Week? <laughs> yeah, so I do these weekly legal news roundups uh, every week for original jurisdiction, and I go through different categories like lawyer of the week and judge of the week because I find it is a useful way to organize the information. And this week, I highlighted Judge Newman, who I think was in many ways the most talked about judge. And the reason is that her battle with her colleagues on the federal circuit, which hears uh, a wide range of federal cases, but mainly I think it's best known for its patent stuff. Her conflict with her colleagues in the federal circuit has reached a new stage. Her colleagues issued a unanimous order suspending her for one year, basically keeping her off the bench and not allowing her to hear cases for one year. And this is basically taking away somebody's federal judgeship, essentially, without any kind of impeachment or s process along those lines. It arises under the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, which is this 1980 law, which is supposed to allow courts to remove or, or temporarily suspend colleagues who have engaged in misconduct or are unable to function. And the act provides that judges can be barred from hearing cases, quote, on a temporary basis for a time certain, close quote. But this is a one-year order that is renewable. So, it does raise the prospect of Judge Newman never being able to hear cases again. And I am less interested in the merits of whether or not Judge Newman, who is, as you mentioned, 96, is on the ball or not. Uh, there's conflicting evidence on that. Uh, some people say she is really sharp. Other people say, no, she's out of it. But I, what I was just really troubled by, and I've written about this before in Original Jurisdiction, is how this case was not transferred to the Judicial Council of Another Circuit, because there is so much inside baseball here. It is clear that there's a lot going on in terms of grudges and personal relationships between Judge Newman and her colleagues. And in situations where a circuit judge's conduct is on uh, under scrutiny, things typically get referred to another court. But the Federal Circuit declined to refer this, and they did the investigation, and they then just issued their order suspending Judge Newman. She's going to appeal this to the basically the Judicial Conference of the United States. So now, finally, some outside eyes will look at it. But I was just really troubled from a due process perspective about how this case involving a bunch of circuit judges trying to oust their colleague, a colleague who is known for her frequent dissenting in that court. I was just troubled by why they didn't send this to a, an objective uh, other circuit. I would not really be so troubled by the outcome if another circuit conducted the investigation and signed off and said, look, uh, Judge Newman is unfortunately, despite her decades of contributions to the federal bench, unable to discharge her duties. That would be one thing if another court did it. And this uh, failure to send the case to another circuit has been condemned by a bunch of judges, including two former chief judges of the federal circuit and also former chief judge of the Fifth Circuit, Edith Jones. So I think a lot of us are troubled by just the process and, again, not about the, the substance. And one, one small point to make, technically, this proceeding is not because she is unable to discharge her duties. They narrowed the complaint. They are now going after her and suspending her for a year because she refused to submit to a medical examination. And Judge Newman, through her lawyers, has said, I will submit to a medical examination, but you need to transfer this case first so that it is not not all under the control of my colleagues with whom I clearly have issues. Yeah, it, you know, you raise a, this raises a good sort of meta point about due process because to what extent do we trust institutions, especially public institutions, to engage in self-policing? Now, sometimes it's kind of, it's very difficult to avoid given the separation of powers and the structure of our system that, for example, Congress is going to set its own rules 
Um, and it's, and you're going to have it to an extent to which the judiciary is going to police the judiciary, but to the greatest extent possible, self-policing is a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, to this greatest extent possible, limit self-policing because it's fundamentally a bad idea as only thousands of years of human history illustrate. And when you think about it, there's not that many institutions in, in American life that are truly self-policed as much as the judiciary is. Now, the judiciary, and, and I'm not saying that I think the judiciary is functioning quite well compared to other branches of government. So, I, But when it comes to this issue of accountability and, police, and policing itself, there, there's just too much sort of latitude given to each individual circuit, in my view. So I, I, I think that's the right formulation. I don't think it's that disruptive at all to any of the circuits, although I'm, I'm very open to, you know, a, a listener providing argument to the contrary. But transferring this this dispute over to another circuit doesn't strike me as terribly burdensome. Um, and you know, look again. I'll I'll say this again. I've said it a million times. I think our, the federal judiciary is our best functioning branch of government. Um, but self policing makes you vulnerable. Um, it makes you vulnerable. And and if we want to improve improve trust, and in many ways improve trust in a way that will allow people to actually see and recognize. How healthy the institution is overall. I, I think, um, I think your analysis is really sound. Sorry, you know, this has not been the David and David disagree show. <laughs> well, I'll just make one point to give the other side its due. The order does go into why they decided not to transfer this. And they claim that one, there were no exceptional circumstances, but pretty much every other circuit that has had a situation involving a circuit judge, uh, being under scrutiny has viewed that as exceptional circumstances. It's different when a district or magistrate judge is reviewed. And in those cases, the circuit courts have been happy to handle the matter themselves. But when it's a bunch of circuit judges reviewing actions by a fellow circuit judge, that usually does get sent out. So I don't know, understand their, their denial of exceptional circumstances. And then the second argument they make, which goes to your self-policing point, is they say, well, we are so much better to equip to handle this because we're dealing with Judge Newman day to day. We're in the trenches. We know all about her. But that is the whole argument about why we have recusal and why we have transfer and how why we have the principle that no person should be a judge in their own case. In most cases, if you're the fact finder and the adjudicator, we don't want you to have firsthand personal knowledge of the players and of the facts. It will be like a judge who has a case before her involving allegations of sexual harassment at her former firm. And she says, well, you know, I should handle this case and not recuse because this is my former firm. I practiced with these people for years. I'm in the trenches. I know these people better than anyone else. We don't want the judge bringing their personal knowledge and personal opinions to the dispute. We want somebody who's a blank slate who's going to review this fairly and objectively. So I just found the argument of the federal circuit that, well, we know Judge Newman the best. We know how a terrible she is because we're dealing with her day to day. That's the whole point why you would want to recuse. And again, one final point on this. It's not necessarily about impartiality. Let's assume that Chief Judge Kimberly Moore and her colleagues can investigate Im impartially. It's about the appearance of impartiality. And Judge Newman has been called the great dissenter of her court. She frequently disagrees with her colleagues. And so to have all of them trying to exile the great dissenter uh, of their court uh, without any outside check, that that does seem like a bad example of self-policing. Yeah, well, thus endeth this podcast of agreement. <laughs> David, I uh, really appreciate you filling in for Sarah. And when I, and it'll be see you later, not goodbye, um, which I know from the feedback from the listeners is a good thing. They do not want it to be goodbye. They just want it to be a see you later. And again, can't emphasize enough uh, our gratitude for you filling in. And um, yeah, as I said at the beginning, you've been so good at it. I'm like slightly bitter that everyone loves the <laughs> podcast because of you. So I appreciate it. 